All right, I have 1.30. We'll go ahead and get started. If you can hear my voice, that means you've gotten over the first and maybe the biggest hurdle of today and your speakers are indeed working. Uh, if not, please type a message out in the chat box and Martha and Kari uh, will, will get in touch with you. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, excited to talk with you on this, uh, where I'm at, very cloudy, rainy spring day and talking to you about season extension and being able to grow uh, vegetables throughout the year, essentially. And so let's dive right into it right away by first talking about what is season extension? Well, I can say for the, the backyard gardener, there's probably about three ways to take season extension. The first one is uh, extending the warm season crops into the shoulder months of the year, and uh, a term that I actually heard from a Cornell uh, vegetable crops uh, specialist, he called this season acceleration, uh, in that many people will use this uh, in order to be the first on the block with the tomatoes. And essentially what someone is doing here is they're capturing that solar energy and they're speeding up the growing degree days. Uh, this really only gives someone a couple extra weeks, and I say maybe a month of uh, extra growing time on both ends of the summer growing season. So in this top uh, list of the months, so the primary growing season for our summer crops, um, at least here in central Illinois, it was pretty much May through, or sorry, June through September. By adding season extension devices, which we're gonna talk about today, you might be able to tack on another month on either end of those. Kind of depends all on the weather. However, there's also uh, the idea of extending the cool season crops into the winter, which is the second uh, way of taking this, and is, by the way, my favorite, which is why it's highlighted and bold, underlined uh, here on the screen, or, there's, you can do both, and I do understand not every home garden is gonna have the space for doing both of these because if you have a tomato plant in the garden and you have a small garden, it's taking up space that could otherwise be occupied by say a couple rows of lettuce and then vice versa. And so you, you kinda can weigh things out between the warm season crops versus the cool season crops. So as I said, I prefer to use my season extension for cool season crops. I, I, I feel like everyone grows a tomato, but few gardeners seem to grow delicious cool season crops. I think of these as the forgotten vegetables like spinach and lettuce, carrots and kale and cabbage and many, many others. Um, so as the weather cools, and the, why I like fall gardening so much is as the temperatures uh, drop in, in the fall, pr primarily my favorite time of year to garden, um, this, the plants produce sugars uh, in their tissues to help them to avoid the freezing temperatures, which then leads to much sweeter produce. Add in the cooler weather, the fewer temperature or fewer pests uh, out out and about, and it just makes it a joy to be out in the garden in the fall. So I like to use season extension for the fall months and even this time of year. So uh, the other thing to note with uh, this garden calendar here, so the green uh, months on this one below for extending cool season crops into the winter, so the green indicates uh, the months when you would typically be growing cool season crops. Again, where I'm at in central Illinois, this might vary a little bit depending where you're at in the country. Um, so if you think about what using season extension, the yellow highlighted months, those are the months where you can actually extend the season into. And then I put a red X on August because if you're using a season extension device, you can, you can eliminate probably August from your cool season crops and then keep that in like uh, summer crops and just push that cool season even farther later into the fall. So key point here, we are not going to be discussing uh, greenhouses, though I would love to have a greenhouse. I love the greenhouse would be amazing. Um, what greenhouses, the way they the way they control the climate with them is using active uh, some type of active heating device. Um, so that means there's some type of a heat source within the structure itself. It could be geothermal, propane, electric steam, even uh, folks will use wood stoves. 
what we're going to be talking about today is uh, using passive heating by trapping sunlight in various types of structures. We're going to talk about cloches, cold frames, low tunnels, and high tunnels. But before we get into those season extension structures, let's talk about growing for a fall or winter or even early spring harvest and what to expect from our garden. So the thing to keep in mind uh, with growing in the cooler season of the year is uh, if we grow, say, during the summer, the primary limiting factor is going to be water because it's hot, it's dry, might, be, might not be raining as much, and also soil nutrients. Uh, and this is because many plants within the garden and surrounding the garden are growing uh, very quickly and actively. We're using a lot of soil nutrients within um, the growing area, and so we tend to have to fertilize a little bit more. However, in the cool season, watering, um, the task of watering is greatly diminished. In fact, once we pass pretty much into, say, November here, um, I rarely have to uh, go out and water anything in a season extension uh, device where I'm growing. The primary limiting factor, though, for us growing in the fall and winter garden are going to be sunlight and temperature. So even though we're talking about cool season crops, these crops can't survive our Midwestern winters when they are at their harshest. So we have to modify the growing environment to keep those crops alive, which means we have to manage our heat and light. So here is uh, basically the physics of what's going on. And what we're doing is we're capturing solar radiation with the season extension device. Uh, what happens here is light energy in the form of photons beams outward from the sun. And then what photons make it into our atmosphere will strike a surface, whatever type of surface. Some of those photons will bounce off the surface as light energy and it illuminates and reveals the world around us. Other photons though will be absorbed by that surface and then re-radiate out as heat energy. And it is this heat that we wish to capture with our season extension device and those which we are going to discuss here in the next section. So we are something to keep in mind too is we are not simply heating up the plants or like the ab above ground portion of the plants. Season extension, a big part about it is capturing and storing that heat in the soil. So again, maintaining a growing environment, heat and light, that is the goal when we're talking about season extension in the cooler months of the year. So throughout the year, the sun's angle in the sky, it changes uh, due to the tilt uh, or the, the axis tilt of our planet. And um, as we know, the sun is higher in the sky in the summer and lower in the sky during the winter. So for us in the northern hemisphere during the winter, the sun dips down to the southern horizon, which shortens our days, and it limits the amount of light. Additionally, the, the angle of the winter sun um, in the southern sky, um, as it, uh, the, that, that angle it has, um, means that the sun's rays or the light has to travel th more uh, through our atmosphere. And that is another item which is actually going to reduce that intensity of the sunlight even more. So in the winter, our, our days are shorter and the sun's light is not as intense. So the other thing to keep in mind, despite our common um, kind of say misconception that we feed plants with fertilizer, plants actually take care of that themselves. Plants, they make their own food through photosynthesis and photosynthesis requires light. So less light means photosynthesis slows down, which then slows down the other uh, plant growth and development processes. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is that the coverings that we use to protect our crops are also going to factor in into reducing that light intensity that makes it to the plant leaves. So what is the takeaway here? Well, essentially what this means because of those short days in the winter with the less light intensity, this means our plant growth needs to take place earlier in the season. 
So we saw this graph already um, for when we should, when we would be growing cool season crops. Again, um, you know, if we're using some type of season extension device, we could be growing uh, June, July, August. But if that season extension device is primarily for cool season crops, we start, we could start growing them in September, harvest them all the way up into May, and and so that's kind of that that time period that we're talking about. We're growing. Um, starting August all the way up into uh, May, right there. This is another one uh, item here, kind of a rule of thumb. Um, as I was taught, is that beds should run north to south. However, research actually shows this matters little so long as the crops of the plants to the south don't shade out those adjacent to the north. So. I think beds, um, it, I think there's kind of give and takes to both. So if you run your beds east to west, it does limit crop rotation because you can't, uh, you, you can't put those taller crops like the sweet corn and the tomatoes or the trellis cucumbers, you can't put those on the south side of your garden because it will shade out those other plants on the north side potentially. Um, and so I, I really do prefer to run the length of my garden beds uh, north to south. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're going, if you, if you want to extend your growing season, don't site your growing beds north of buildings or trees because even if they get plenty of sun in the summer, they will be in the shade during the winter. So here is an aerial photograph of uh, my uh, primary season extension device, which is a high tunnel. We'll talk about these things here in a little bit, um, but the high tunnel is uh, right here. And there is a uh, north arrow pointing north is uh, towards the top of the photograph. And this photograph is taken, uh, I, I think it would probably be taken later on in the winter, probably maybe even around this time of year. So you see the grass is uh, greening up, but the trees are still bare. But it, the interesting thing you can do with something like this is you can look at the, sh the, the patterns of the shading, say, from the structure here on the south side uh, of the building. And then also, it might be difficult to see on the screen, but there's actually two trees to the north of uh, this high tunnel, which doesn't really pose much of a problem in the winter because the sun, as we've said, is in the southern hemisphere uh, the southern portion of the sky, you know, in this lower uh, part here coming in uh, that direction, coming in from the south that way. So this high tunnel is pretty much uh, in, in the open in the winter months. However, when those trees in the north of it leaf out, um, you know, the, the back half of that high tunnel does get shaded a little bit, uh, which for my purposes isn't that bad. It kind of cools it off a little bit more in those really hot dog days of summer. But as you can see here, the high tunnel is nor oriented. Uh, the beds are running north to south, um, uh, uh, keeping it out in the open. Other thing to keep in mind is uh, the prevailing wind direction, which uh, for us here, uh, talking about kind of the winter months, is coming from the northwest. So that's the prevailing winds coming in here. Uh, when it comes to the summer prevailing winds, it's primarily coming from the directly west or maybe from the more southwest portion. Uh, which I can then utilize to cool off my high tunnel. So uh, it's kind of a lot of factors that go into where to site uh, a structure like this. The other things to keep in mind when it comes to temperature management is that low temperatures are also going to slow plant growth. So even though we have cool season crops that are more tolerant of this colder weather, once we hit about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, they will pretty much stop growing. The other thing is uh, soil is going to be serving as, think of it as like the bank where we're going to store our heat. And that heat is actually in the form of that, that energy that we want to hold on to, which are going to keep our plants warmer throughout the nighttime. So when it comes to freezing temperatures in plants, well, here's just kind of the, the skinny on what happens here. Freezing temperatures create sharp ice crystals in the plant tissue. These burst the living cells and they kill the tissue. Some plants do have a bit of a better 
cold tolerance, again, cool season crops, and that's because they're able to produce higher quantities of sugars. Again, it acts as like this antifreeze for uh, resisting uh, those sharp ice crystals forming within the tissue. Soil temperature is also influenced by how much uh, sunlight, as we mentioned before, and the, the other thing I, I will add is a, a problem that I, we've especially been seeing now in the spring of 2018, at least in the March of this year, is the amount of cloudy days that we have been having. Because, uh, again, we are using the sun to passively heat these season extension devices. And it's just been very cloudy this past month. And But that tends to be... Um, you know, the, the way things are in the fall and the winter months. It's just kind of a more cloudy time of year as opposed to summer. So another just item to keep in mind. Another thing uh, that influences soil temperature is the amount of soil moisture. So water takes more energy to heat up. But once, it's, uh, uh, when, once it heats up, that uh, soil holds that heat longer. The other thing is, is that as water freezes, it actually releases energy in the form of heat. And so it's, it's not uncommon to have soil temperatures fall rapidly all the way down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit and then hold there for several days during freezing weather. Even if it gets, uh, you know, bone chillingly cold outside, as that uh, soil moisture freezes, it releases that heat, which keeps that soil temperature up. Another thing is the air temperature, the or the ambient air temperature surrounding the season extension device, and that plays a role in how the heat that we've stored dissipates outward into the environment. So some suggestions here. First one here is uh, do invest in a soil thermometer. Uh, it's a pretty handy tool. I've got mine out right now in the high tunnel. Um, the soil temperature in my high tunnel uh, right now, it's about 45 degrees. And, and checking just the outdoor soil temperature here, it's about 39 degrees. But that, again, is more to do with the cloudy March that we've had. And so once we get some more sunny days, that soil temperature is going to be going up. The other thing we're going to talk about is to keep the soil exposed to sunlight during the day and then cover it back up in the late afternoon. So this is an example of that. Uh, we're going to talk more about this later. But this photograph, this was taken following a minus 12 degree Fahrenheit uh, nighttime. And you can see the lettuce here. It, is, it survived it. And it, it survived the entire winter months. As opposed, and you can see it has this, uh, if you look up this white fabric right there, that's called uh, row cover. Um, so we compare that these plants that were covered at nighttime to the ones that weren't covered at nighttime right next to them, you can see these did not make it. So there's a lot of little things that we can do to keep our plants alive at night, and we're going to talk about these things. And the main other key thing you're, um, you're going to be taking away from this talk is temperature management. So this uh, was a photograph on the left here. This is my phone. Um, this was the Outdoor temperature for this day, it was 39 degrees outside, so above freezing, but still pretty cold. But it was a bright, sunny day. And so the temperature inside the high tunnel was about 76 degrees. And so, again, we're going to be talking about managing our heat. And this we do this by venting it on warm, sunny days. We really do have to keep an eye on the temperature. So let's talk about the different... Um, season extension structures that uh, that are out there. And they can be as simple or as complex, complex as you prefer. We're going to start with the simple uh, structures, and we'll move up to the more involved as we get through this section here. And the first, I mean, this is about as easy as it gets, raised beds. Um, raised beds may not seem to offer anything in the season extension category, but by elevating the growing medium above the, the, the mass of the, the soil, the raised bed soil can warm faster than that soil at grade. So raised bed soil often will warm enough to allow planting a few weeks sooner 
than if you were in an in-ground garden. So we're talking about soil temperatures here. But one thing to keep in mind is you still have to protect that above-ground portion, portion of the plant should the threat of freezing temperatures remain, or maybe we get a late spring uh, freeze or perhaps even an early uh, fall freeze. So we still do have to protect the above-ground portions of those plants should we experience some type of significant freezing event. Next, we have cloches or cloches, depending on who you are and, and how you pronounce this. Uh, these are essentially glass domes or plastic jugs. They can be as uh, simple as bottles with the bottom cut out, um, and you just place these over top of plants. Uh, these can be uh, a pretty inexpensive way to protect plants. Uh, it's kind of fun for kids to be able to get out there, uh, plant a seed, see it come up, and then they can pop, you know, uh, uh, an old you know, Gatorade bottle or something over top of it. And the key thing, though, is you do have to vent these on uh, sunny days because this uh, little bottle can actually store quite a bit of heat. Uh, and if you don't vent it, that little seedling can get heat stressed and, and it could actually kill it. Um, they're pretty small, though, so it can't hold as much thermal mass. So it's not it's not going to keep your crops alive over the course of a typical Illinois winter. So this is not something you can necessarily rely on, uh, say, the January 15th when it's minus 10 degrees outside. So next we have cold frames. And this is the cold frame that I have here. You can see it's, uh, it's uh, doing its job here with a little bit of snow on the ground. But essentially, a cold frame is a, a bottomless box with a clear covering on the top. And typically, it's angled so that you have a better interception of the sunlight, and it's usually oriented uh, uh, towards the south. So that as the, the winter sun rays, will, uh, will, you'll have the optimum amount of uh, sunlight exposure. And there's folks that, that operate uh, differently within cold frames. Some folks will grow directly in the soil inside the cold frame. Others might put flats of plants or pots of plants in, in the cold frame. And there's a lot of different ways to go about uh, constructing a cold frame. Uh, this is a plan I found online of the, I would say, hundreds of plans out there that you can choose from. Uh, this is a pretty good one, though, and, and essentially cold frames are uh, made typically of lumber that is one inch thick. Um, you can go with, like, a, say, a two by four, which gives you better insulation, but just know the cost is going to be higher and it's going to be heavier to move around because cold frame, for at least for me, I move my cold frame around quite a bit. The other thing is use untreated wood because you are creating a um, a sealed up environment and you do not want treated lumber off gassing within um, within that that closed uh, area because there are compounds that would uh, is treated with so that it doesn't rot but that they can be toxic to plants themselves uh, typically most cold frames have some type of a repurposed window as the clear covering but you can use any type of uh, plastic greenhouse film, uh, polycarbonate panels, uh, pretty much any type of clear um, or opaque uh, plastic covering works on these. Ideally, the slope of the covering should be about one inch per foot uh, from the back to the front. And so if I back up here, the reason why I like this plan is uh, this cold frame has is about four foot from front to back. Uh, the back side is 12 inches high, and the front is about 8 inches high, and that's illustrated uh, in this little section here. Uh, but that just goes just uh, further home, drives home that point of uh, for every foot of run, there is an inch of fall. So 12 inches in the back, 4 inches in the front, gives you that optimum angle for sunlight interception, and it works out in that way. And again, there's a lots of stuff available online for these things. Now, we, we mentioned uh, the idea of temperature management. And things like cold frames, uh, the cloches, you do have to vent these, especially if you, when you get those warm, sunny uh, fall, winter, spring days. 
And with the cloche, you just you can open up a lid on the top or pop it off. Cold frame, you have to prop open the lid uh, or the covering of the cold frame. Um, there are folks actually that use cold frames not to uh, keep plants alive, but to actually warm up the soil in the spring. And so that's pretty. That's that is something where you don't really have to worry about propping open that 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 covering. Um, however, you do have plants in there. You have to make sure that they don't reach a maximum temperature. Uh, about you know we're talking 75 degrees for our cool season crops. They do make automatic vent openers, and these are pretty handy to have. They don't require electricity. Uh, so basically, what it is, it's this metal cylinder, this uh, black metal cylinder right here and within there is a, a, a wax a compressed wax and as that wax heats up it there's a piston in there that pushes on the piston and it opens up the 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 lid um, and then as it cools down the wax uh, it then shrinks it contracts and then the springs have uh, enough tension that they will close the lid so these are pretty neat. I, I've seen them range anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks. Um, so a pretty handy tool to have. And this is what was inside my cold frame. Uh, just a couple cool season crops, some turnips, some bok choy. And so um, I, I really like growing it in the cold frame. And the, the really added benefit is I get to move it around quite a bit. There is another type of uh, cold frame but it's built a little bit differently, and it goes by hotbed or hot frame. And essentially, this is some type of a heated cold frame. It's a similar type of structure. It's a bo pretty much that bottomless box with an angled top, but there's some type of heating element inside. And the two primary things that you'll probably find online are going to be they are heated kind of passively through um, composting manure. So the composting process generates heat which then can help to warm up uh, this hot frame. And so what in this top diagram here, basically what you do is you would excavate out, um, you know, several inches of soil. You would then fill the, you know, the bottom four or five inches of that pit that you've dug in with some type of a fresh manure. Over top of that, you would cover it with uh, clean soil and you could plant your veggies in that. And as the manure composts over the winter months, it generates heat and helps to keep that hot frame uh, warm. Um, not, I'm not a big fan of utilizing fresh manure, especially when it comes for growing uh, vegetable crops. So just be very careful in keeping that fresh manure away from any edible portions of your crop. The other thing you can do, which I think is probably a much better technique, is uh, using a, a grower's type of heating cable. So again, you would excavate down uh, four to six inches, and you would fill that, that, air, that bottom portion with some sand or gravel. Then you would snake a heating cable back and forth, making sure the heating cable never crosses or touches itself. Uh, and then over top of that, put a thin layer of sand. You can put some hard layer cloth on that so no critters can get in there and chew on your heating cable. And on top of that, you put soil. So this is definitely, um, th there's a lot more involved in a hot frame. Uh, but as I said, pretty much the sky is the limit when it comes to uh, innovation and kind of tinkering around with these season extension devices. And you know what? These, these cold frames, these cloches, this is not new technology. Um, you can see here, there's a cloche right here, uh, lots of cold frames uh, on the right side of this photograph here. Um, so, so this is not, these are not new techniques. Yes, we do use things uh, like plastic bottles and now, which they didn't have back then. But really, you know, the, the advent here of um, uh, the change, is I, I like this uh, meme right here um, with the where where he's uh, telling them the the future is in plastics. Um, so while the previous season extensions they do certainly use plastic, um, especially as any type of building material. Um, pretty much these next two season extension devices we're going to talk about would not be possible without 
polyethylene greenhouse film, uh, which I am going to be calling poly for short. So this next season extension device uh, is uh, low tunnels. And low tunnels, I just started growing in low tunnels this past year. I really like them. I, it offers a very flexible, low-cost way to provide a protected growing environment to your crops. Um, so I did make a video uh, all about how I went about uh, making uh, our low tunnel here at the McDonough County Extension Office. So essentially, um, the frame of the low tunnel, or think of it as the skeleton, the bones, can be made of a variety of material. But usually, it's a 10 to 8 foot long stick of either, it could be metal conduit, it could be PVC, or it could be some type of a high gauge wire. And these are then bent into 3, 4, 6 foot half circle frames, or as the industry calls them, hoops. One note on using a PVC pipe, um, PVC does react uh, uh, with greenhouse polyfilm and that quickly degrades, that polyfilm actually quickly degrades where these two materials come in contact and several plastic suppliers will not guarantee their product if PVC is used for the hoop. So just something to keep in mind, uh, make sure you read the fine print of any products that you're purchasing. So in light of that, most experienced growers and gardeners are going to use a half-inch metal electrical conduit. I opt for the EMT type, as this conduit has a thinner wall and it's cheaper. So what I did is I used a pipe bender. I, that's me on the top photograph right here. The pipe bender is right, right there. Um, used the pipe bender, and I bent uh, this 10-foot uh, metal pipe into four foot hoops. And you can purchase a pipe bender like this from any type of grower supply store. And actually, I found lots of different plans online for making your own pipe bender. Um, and it creates nice uniform hoops and then you take them out into the garden. And you really, you don't wanna space these any farther than about six foot uh, from each other. And you probably want to go a little bit closer, maybe even like four foot away apart um, if you live in an area that receives uh, lots of wind or lots of snow. You can secure the hoops to, say, uh, the, the edges of a raised bed frame. You can use pipe straps or clamps. Uh, if you're an in-ground gardener, uh, simply what I did is I pushed the ends of the hoops into the ground um, you can even put some rebar in ahead of time and slip them over top of the rebar. There's, again, there's many things you can do to, to make your structure more secure and more stable. What I did is I uh, installed a rope along the center of the hoops to kind of act as like a spine. And so I, I hammered in stakes on um, either end of the low tunnel. And then I just strung a rope um, from one end to the other, looped it around each metal hoop, uh, and uh, fastened it to a stake at the uh, opposite end of the low tunnel. I pulled it very tightly and secured it, and this really helped with resisting wind and snow loads, but as I found out, oh, sorry, jumping the gun here, um, Something to keep in mind also is the covering material that you're going to be using here. So there's two different types that I have used uh, in um, my low tunnel. There's row cover fabric, and the picture on the left side of the screen here, there's two different types of row cover. And, and it's just the, the one here on the left is thicker than the one here on the right. And you can buy row cover in many different thicknesses. Um, and so but row cover, it's a plastic spun fiber material. It's porous, which uh, means that it's going to um, let air and some amounts of water through it in addition to light. It, um, I, I would say row cover is what I first installed earlier in the fall as temperatures began to cool off. It provided adequate protection as night started to dip below uh, towards freezing. And it's also handy to use in the spring as a protective cover, especially as those pest insects populations start to grow. 
Some growers uh, and gardeners will, will actually use row cover all season long to keep pests off of crops that don't require pollination, such as salad greens, turnips, broccoli, potatoes, and others. But for those crops that do re require pollination, uh, you, you can take the row cover, or you can leave the row cover on until those plants start to flower. When it comes to greenhouse uh, polyplastic, um, this is something that I put over top of the row cover, which I already had on my low tunnel, to add on that, uh, like pretty much that additional level of winter protection um, once temperatures were reliably going below freezing. So the thing about this plastic film is that it does allow light through. It, it traps heat, but it does not let water through. The other thing why I'm saying greenhouse polyplastic um, is because this is a product that has been uh, manufactured to have uh, to, to withstand UV uh, degradation. Why can't we just go to the hardware store and purchase a drop cloth or some plastic drop cloth or something like that? Well, it's because those have not been created to withstand UV light and the extremes of the weather, the outdoors. And so the idea here is that this plastic should last you at least four, hopefully seven years. That uh, plastic drop cloth that you would get, say, from the hardware store, maybe it will last you a growing season. It might not even last you that long. Typically, these are sold in 10-foot wide uh, rolls, uh, and so that should accommodate most low tunnel sizes. And so even though, so my, my hoops are four foot wide, you have to take into account that they rise a couple feet off the ground. So that means this makes about a 10 foot wide sheet of poly fit perfectly. And I got a little bit extra on the sides here to place, uh, I have blocks, uh, you can use sandbags to hold down the edges. The other thing to keep in mind is that your bed length is going to vary in most of the gardens. All you do is you cut the poly to fit your bed length, but you have to remember to account that there's going to be several feet on either end due to the height of the hoops, and also you're going to be securing that plastic down. So you're going to want to make sure you have a little bit of extra polyplastic, a couple feet um, on either end as well. To, so when I installed the, the top picture is me putting on the, the row cover, um, and then the bottom one here is me putting on the, the polyplastic over top of the row cover. What I used, I used these plastic clips, and those are designed to fit over a half-inch EMT metal conduit, but any type of durable spring clip is going to work for, for securing these, these items. So on one end, I would secure it with these plastic clips, and then I would go to the other end, and I would pull the material as tightly as I could and then secure it on that end with the clips. And I only fastened the, the row cover and the poly to the, the hoops on either end of the low tunnel. I don't fasten them on this, uh, the center hoops there. Um, I tried that once, and I found out it really doesn't do anything. And um, most of the time, those clips would just pop off. It's the ones on the end hoops. Um, they are they're they're holding the most uh, of the weight there when it comes to like wind and snow. I then use a concrete block to weigh down the edges. Now this is not the ideal material to use. I just, I pretty much I use it because that's all that I had. Um, these are pretty heavy uh, concrete blocks. Um, ideally you want to use something like a sandbag. Uh, you want to fill the sandbag with rock. You don't want to use soil because actually soil in the sandbag will dry out over the winter and you can wind up with a much lighter sandbag by the end of the winter, which may not be enough to hold down that plastic. Uh, the thing with the concrete block is, is pretty much as that plastic moves in the wind, the, the corners of that block are sharp and it just it tears into the poly. Um, so, you know, in order to make your materials last longer, purchase the, the, the right stuff. And in this case, it would be, you know, sandbags or something that would preserve the lifetime of this material. 
And finally, uh, this bottom picture here is me. I pretty much twisting the ends of the low tunnel uh, plastic with uh, kind of like a giant Tootsie Roll. And then I weigh those down again with more heavy block. And something to keep in mind, central Illinois, especially wind is kind of a problem for us. And I need lots of those heavy blocks to keep my plastic from flying away across the highway. So this is a picture um, this past fall in 2017, we were getting gusts all day long above 50 miles per hour. So even with the rope uh, along the center hoops with all the blocks there, uh, the, the hoops collapsed. It, it, there was just, um, just too much force um, hitting that, that low tunnel and those hoops collapsed. So to combat the wind issue, uh, this next coming year, I'm going to be fastening my hoops to the raised bed frame using pipe straps. Um, I'd also like to install uh, a channel uh, using uh, one by ones um, on the side of the raised bed frame. Uh, so a channel which I can tack the plastic down on the prevailing wind side that's going to hold that plastic in place even if the hoops collapse. Because the last thing I want to do is uh, drive up to work and my low tunnel plastic is flying across the highway as I'm coming into work. And um, following that and securing uh, the hoops a little bit better and using a couple more extra heavy block, this is what um, what happened, this was last January, this past January in 2018. Um, you know, it's a pretty bleak landscape outside. Uh, the low tunnel's covered in snow, but what's going on in there? Well, this is the crops that were growing underneath all of that snow. Um, we have uh, spinach. Uh, there's some cabbage, which shocked me that it was surviving this cold winter weather. We were holding carrots uh, in there, too, and we had some kale plants. So. Even though it was the middle of January, uh, frigid, freezing temperatures, nasty weather outside, we have a crops that are green um, and uh, looking delicious in our low tunnel. So next we're going to talk high tunnels. And um, a lot of folks also call these hoop houses. Um, this is my high tunnel here at the extension office. It's a, it's a uh, 12 by 24 uh, foot uh, high tunnel. It only costs about 400 bucks for us to put it together. Um, and so again, most people call these hoop houses. Essentially what it is, it's a low tunnel big enough for you to walk inside. The other interesting thing about this, um, you know, I, I don't, oh, we're not gonna go into much detail on high tunnels. Um, because these might not be as well suited to the home gardener. However, I have been seeing lots of backyard gardeners, especially in the northern parts of the US, they are turning the high tunnels to extend their season. Um, you know, you get past in northern Illinois and, and farther up from there. And um, the, the interesting about the thing about this is, yes, high tunnels, they're like a permanent structure in that um, at least with ours here, we drove um, metal conduit pipe into the ground. And, and so this is not something we can pick up and move uh, without you know, significant effort on our part and probably some heavy equipment. Um, so even though it's, it's kind of built like a permanent structure because we don't want it to blow away, it's actually not classified as a permanent structure for most uh, like city codes. Uh, the government actually classifies this as an agricultural tool, which is why a lot of homeowners um, can utilize stuff, something like this in their backyard because um, they can look at the uh, how the government classifies these and says, this is not a permanent structure, this is an agricultural tool. Um, so again, when it comes to high tunnels, your, your expense of the, the high tunnel is only limited by your ingenuity. And the other thing is these high tunnels, I would say they're probably some of the best tools we have at protecting crops throughout the duration of winter because they can capture more light and they can store more heat just because they're big. So that means they have more mass, that they can store more thermal mass. And that's, you know, this is what I, I 
this is just the harvest out of the high tunnel. Again, these are cool season crops. We got lettuce, we got turnips, we got kale. Um, and so these are just a lot of fun to grow in. You're, you're harvesting and picking tasty produce on, at times of year when there's nothing else happening out in the landscape. And so I really do enjoy growing, especially in the high tunnel, my low tunnel this year. It has been a lot of fun. If you want to see more videos about um, low tunnels and high tunnels, uh, check out the University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube channel. Um, I do a series of videos called Greenspeak. Basically, I, I share all this information uh, in person. Uh, in, in that we're, we're, we're live, we're showing this, this footage here of uh, what's going on in low tunnels, high tunnels, and throughout the, the garden here. So let's talk about growing within these season extension devices. And the first thing we're, we're wondering is what to plant. And we've already talked about this. We're planting cool season crops. With what, what's included in that? Well, we're talking greens, like lettuces and spinach, kale, Swiss chard. Um, you also have root crops like carrots. Um, beets and turnips. I overwintered carrots this year. I also overwintered parsnips this year. Uh, it worked very well inside the high tunnel and low tunnel. We also have um, alliums, which uh, include things like leeks, green onion, red, yellow onion bulbs. Um, when you're looking through seed catalogs, and you're interested in, in utilizing these season extension devices, look for crops marketed as those that are for winter harvest, uh, or, or maybe they, they can store well um, over winter in the ground, which is what we would say if you're growing carrots. You want something that stores well in the ground. If you can harvest carrots all winter long, so long as they've grown um, uh, during their, the time when they need to grow, when there's more sunlight. So with cool season crops, there are obviously minimum and ideal and maximum temperatures that these crops like. So again, we need to manage these temperatures. So as we saw this, we've already seen this picture before. Um, in the high tunnel, it was 76 degrees in the middle of winter, which is pretty warm if you're a cool season crop. Um, that's kind of at the, that's pretty much at the height, if not over their ideal range of temperatures. So get too hot, and they start becoming stressed. Um, some of those cool season crops actually will abandon vegetative growth because it's, okay, you know, the cool season's over, here comes the summer, it's getting hot, and they will begin bolting, which is the term for going to flower. This can turn produce bitter, and it signals the end of the plant's life cycle. So in my high tunnel, I have a remote temperature sensor. Uh, the readout sits right here on my desk and inside. And this way I can, this is, this is it right here, I can keep tabs on the temperature in my high tunnel. The other thing that, um, for better or for worse, a season extension device, uh, it's, and if you have plants growing within it, it is going to bind you to your daily weather forecasts. So I, I go in, I check the weather in the morning, I decide whether uh, or not to vent my season extension device depending on uh, the high temperatures for the day. And also I think about uh, cloud cover and wind. Uh, these are all considerations as to whether that season extension device is going to get too hot and will need to be vented. If you do open up your season extension device, whether it's a cold frame or a high tunnel, you have to remember to close it mid to late afternoon to avoid losing too much heat as temperatures start to fall at the end of the day. So these are the ideal uh, ranges for, uh, and, and the maximum temperatures for um, the main cool season crop. The main cool season crop for most are going to be leafy greens. So the ideal range is between 60 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Maximum is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. As you saw in that, that last picture, you know, the, the thermometer in, in my high tunnel was at 76 degrees. That's, again, that's pretty warm uh, for being the middle of winter. And so in order to avoid hitting that point, typically you want to vent once it reaches about 55 degrees inside um, that season extension device because it will it will drain out that, that excessive uh, heat, but it's still going to, even though it's vented, it can still 
build up more heat throughout the day, and you can still hit that 60 to 65 degree range. But So vent around 55 degrees is kind of a, a tip or rule of thumb. We also have to keep in mind our cool season crops have minimum temperatures that they can survive. So these are the minimum temperatures for some common cool season crops. So 25 degrees, kind of the high end here. Um, we're looking at things like bok choy, um, Napa cabbage, mizuna, green onions. However, I would say, um, you know, 25 degrees in the high tunnel, it's different than 25 degrees than outdoors. Uh, just because I've grown bok choy in the high tunnel and I've grown it outdoors at the same time, and even though in the high tunnel it got down to 25 degrees at nighttime, uh, it, it rebounds fairly quickly, whereas outside it kind of lingers at that low temperature uh, in the early morning hours. So also uh, arugula, tatsoi, 22, uh, you know, we get down to 20 degrees, and then we get some pretty hardy plants there. Uh, Russian kale, 15 degrees, 10 degrees. We're talking our Swiss chard and carrots. Um, and then zero degrees, plants that can survive zero degrees Fahrenheit, chives, corn salad, parsnips. Um, and then the, I would say some spinach, I would say every spinach I've grown has uh, survived the winters for the last three years that I have been growing all throughout the winter months. So when do we plant these crops? Well, for those uh, extending the season in the fall, um, uh, that's again, that's my favorite time to grow is the fall. Um, you pretty much have to start planting in the late summer. Remember, we have to take advantage of those long days. Um, if you're in the spring, if you're you're going to be growing in the spring, basically mid to late winter. Uh, if you want to be growing out in the season extension device, like right now. Um, you could have had your cool season crops started, you know, first part of February um, is about actually mid-February as I started a bunch of lettuce, which is out in the high tunnel right now as we speak. It's uh, on, uh, got to check the date here. It's March 27th right now. Um, so, and, and it's growing, it's, it's doing great. Um, the other thing to keep in mind for those uh, growing in, um, the fall months, you really do have to have your seed ordered and in hand by August 1. Even though you probably aren't going to be doing anything with it by then, it's just a good rule to follow because it, it just always happens. You know, we're having fun in the summer, and maybe the garden is is kind of uh, you know overwhelming a little bit. We forget to order our seed, and then September rolls around. We don't have any seed for our fall garden. So make it a rule to have any fall or spring, early spring crop seed in hand by August 1st. The thing to, to note on uh, seed packs is they will indicate the date to uh, maturity. Here it's it's just indicated as days uh, and it's 57 days uh, to maturity. And obviously this varies by crop, um, by variety even. And so, but seed packets should have the number of days printed on it. If they don't, you can look it up online or give us a call at your local extension office. Um, we can check and see if we can find a, a days of maturity for the, the type of vegetable you might be looking at. So next thing comes uh, when you know your date of uh, to maturity, um, you then want to look at the calendar. Now let's say we're planting a fall crop and we want to have Let's say we want to have a nice spread of maybe root crops, uh, maybe a good salad for Thanksgiving. Uh, and here in this calendar, Thanksgiving here, November 26. Um, so what you would do is you would find out when you wanted to harvest, and you would just count backwards. So you would use the uh, again that if it was this broccoli, you would use those 57 days. You count backwards like that. Something to keep in mind though, as those days get shorter and shorter in the fall. That means the daylight, again, the daylight, the uh, light intensity is not the same as when you're growing in the middle of the summer. So you're going to have to add on a couple extra days. If you're growing pretty late in the season, you might have to add on up to 28 days or almost an extra month um, to the seed pack. Again, this depends on the crop depends on day length. It also depends on whether we're getting a lot of cloudy days or not. Uh, so keep that in mind that you're going to have to tack on some extra days 
uh, say if we're using 57 days, you know, you're probably going to be tacking on maybe up to 70 days of grow time for that crop. The other thing that I, I found, just in, in looking around on the internet, is every state extension has a guide on when to plant fall crops. U of I extension has one. Uh, the surrounding state extensions here have one. If you're not in Illinois, your state extension service probably has a guide on when to plant fall crops. There are tools available to folks online um, for calculating when to plant and harvest their crops. And so, Let's look at this planting calculator. It's for fall crops. Uh, it's a spreadsheet you basically download from a company called Johnny's. Um, it's not a promotion or any kind of their company, just using their calculator as a visual aid. So if I check my first frost date, I'm using the Illinois State Water Survey website here on the left. Um, I'm in Macomb, and so the closest weather stations here to Macomb are Carthage and Monmouth. Um, and so both show, you know, relatively close uh, kind of fall freeze date here. And then let's see, uh, I, I would just plug that into the calculator here into the spreadsheet. And then I get this list of crops right here and the date when I should be planting them. Now this is fall planting without a season extension device. So therefore, um, here we are planting most of our crops, uh, looks mid to late July, maybe early August. Um, but if we add on about three weeks, which we, can, which we can do when we're using a season extension device. So again, when we use a season extension device, we can compensate by adding on about three extra weeks. So if we, instead of 10, 11, uh, 2018 as our freeze date, we add on three weeks uh, to about November 1. Now we're planting in like mid-August into September. And so that's kind of the beauty of season extension devices is, um, you know, we, 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 can, we can push that summer crop window a little bit farther, especially for the type of gardener that likes to transition from summer crops to cool season crops. And then those season extension devices can hold those cool season crops throughout the winter months. So just um, as we wind down here, some, uh, some considerations. Uh, be prepared. You, you are going to be planting crops outside of uh, basically what the industry conceives as the normal time to plant things. Uh, you know, everyone is planting stuff in the late spring. So that means a lot of the big box garden centers, they're not going to have any transplant veggie stock available. Some, maybe a hip local garden center could offer some cool season transplants. Maybe they'll have some seed at the right time of year. But usually, you know, when you go to those local garden stores uh, kind of late in the summer, or really, really early, make like winter pretty much, those greenhouses, they're empty and the seed shelves are bare. Um, and that is like what happened to me this year. I wanted to start my seedlings um, in basically uh, mid-January. Nobody was selling potting soil. And so it was one of those things you just had to wind up ordering it. Um, so because supplies are going to be limited, if they're at all, you are more than likely going to have to start these plants yourself from seed. Either you're starting them indoors or you're going to be sowing them directly in the ground. So seed starting, that is a huge topic. We don't have time to cover it here. So check out, um, we already have a webinar on seed starting. Um, again, it's at the University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube channel. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about seed starting, this is a good resource. I mentioned this already, but I, I really want to reinforce that if you grow in a low tunnel or a cold frame, or maybe you have a high tunnel, use row covers as an extra layer of protection. Uh, row covers can give you about 10 to 15 degrees of protection within a season extension device. So again, this is uh, our Salanova lettuce under the row cover. Uh, these crops experience the negative 12 degree night, but because they, and they're growing inside the high tunnel, but 
they also have this extra layer of row cover on top of them. Um, and these Salanova lettuce are only hardy to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a, a pretty, I mean, I, I became a, a believer after utilizing uh, row cover, especially this past winter. It does need um, almost daily management if you want to go that far. Um, so on sunny days, I pull the row cover off so the soil and the crops get as much sunlight as possible so I can build up that heat in the soil. And then by mid to late afternoon, I come back out and I cover those um, plants up. Um, I lay these directly on the, the plants, but there are growers that have um, other uh, kind of techniques, uh, tricks here. Um, you can see uh, this is a local CSA grower here in Macomb. Uh, he takes these uh, old uh, fence panels and he just bends them in hoops and he just lays his row cover over top of those. Um, and then he's got another row of row cover right here, and that's just laying directly on the plants themselves. Um, some folks will string like a wire across, and they will drape the row cover up uh, on it, kind of like a um, kind of like a, a, a shower curtain or something. I would say in the winter, watering will nearly stop. Um, kind of the one exception here is this uh, last year, late fall and into the early winter in 2017, uh, it had been pretty warm and dry. And so I did have to go out and water things in the low tunnel and the high tunnel by hand. Uh, I usually, uh, during the summer months, use an automatic drip irrigation system. But once we start getting freezing nighttime temperatures, I winterize that because you don't want those breaking because uh, there's frozen water in them. Um, so when you're watering in a season extension device, water midday when the night is forecasted to uh, be somewhat mild. Um, I, would say the, I would say the critical thing, though, is to make sure any water on the soil surface and on any leaves dry before nightfall. Um, and you just pretty much try to avoid getting the plant t tissue wet um, because if you, you, you run the risk of those forming, you know, freezing and forming ice and, you know, killing, you know, killing the plant tissue there. When it comes to harvest, um, can't really harvest any time you want. That's one of the, the drawbacks of winter growing. Um, you can see this uh, picture on the, the top right of the screen. This is spinach. I took this picture. Uh, it was a freezing cold day in the low tunnel. The, the spinach is, is wilted. And we do not want to be harvesting when um, the, the spinach is wilted like this. Um, it, the only reason is these crops are experiencing freezing temperatures. They wilt to protect themselves. Once it warms up, they will regain um, turgidity again, and they, they will pop back up. That's when we want to go out and harvest on a sunny day uh, when the temperatures are above freezing. This is especially true. You want to make sure the temperatures are above freezing because if you pop off that, that uh, cold frame or that low tunnel plastic and it's below freezing outside, those crops, that, that freezing cold air is just going to rush in there and it, it could do a lot of damage. It would, it would be a very abrupt change in temperature. The other thing here, uh, the photograph on the bottom right, um, I say harvest mature produce before warm weather returns. And so there's some crops like parsnips and carrots. Um, you can pretty much hold these in the soil all winter long. But once the soil starts to warm up in the spring, um, these plants will resume their growth. And once, say, parsnips start growing again in the early spring, once you start to see that new green growth, it pulls a energy out of the root system to resume that growth, and you wind up getting um, a, a less flavor in the roots, and the roots become more fibrous uh, and just not as tasty than as if you would harvest them before they they resumed their growth in the spring. So just some takeaways here. Um, we're a little bit over uh, an hour long here, but I just want to. Just uh, kind of final remarks here. It's all about managing temperature. You're capturing sunlight, which is going to heat up the air and the soil inside the season extension device. You then have to keep an eye on the temperature and vent out any excess heat so you don't stress out 
the cool season crops. Um, the growing of crops also needs to take place when there is ample light. So once days begin to shorten, just keep in mind your growth is going to slow down. And it's pretty much going to stop once we get into the dark winter months. I'd say December and January, there's not much growing because it's just too dark. Season extension devices will allow us to hold our plants in that stasis mode during the coldest uh, months of the year. You can also use your season extension to extend um, the growing season for warm season vegetables um, for about a month on either end, but I still would say the cool season veggies are much more fun to grow through the entire winter months. So like all things learning, um, when you're growing in the fall and winter and early spring, um, this is going to take time. Um, find out what crops you like to grow. You know, the first time I grew a, a, a garden for the, the winter months, I planted 20 kale plants. Um, there came a point uh, during that winter when my wife said to never bring that stuff inside again. So now I only grow two. Um, so you got to know what's appropriate for you, what works for you. I also learned a lot about temperature management uh, that first couple years. And so, you know, now I can look out at the weather in the morning and I know, um, you know I'm probably going to need to vent the high tunnel today, whereas in the beginning I, I wasn't so sure. So I kept checking the, the temperature on the, on the inside, which was really handy to have a uh, remote uh, thermometer here in my office. The other thing to keep in mind is you can only do uh, so much. Sometimes our coldest winter weather is going to put the kibosh on our season extension efforts. But you know what? I still think it's a lot of fun. Um, the, the harvest, the payoff you get is still really, really nice. So anyone, and a final point here, anyone can have fresh produce from their garden in the middle of winter. Anyone can do this. Uh, this is my contact information. Again, a horticulture educator. I, I'm in Macomb. Um, check out uh, recordings of the past webinars, also my videos on um, other season extension devices. I talk about building low tunnels, uh, how to grow in a high tunnel. Um, they're all at um, our YouTube channel, University of Illinois Extension Horticulture. And uh, now I uh, spend the next probably 10, 15 minutes on questions. All right. Well, I'm just looking at the chat box here, and um, I'm, I'm starting with um, uh, Carroll County. Uh, what nighttime temps do you need to maintain right now uh, in starting herbs in a greenhouse? Um, that's a good question, uh, Carroll County. I um, it, it kind of depends on the herbs that you're growing. Um, so there's a lot of the summer herbs. Um, those are not going to be going outside right now. Um, I do have some uh, thyme, um, which uh, has been seeded into flats, and that's just it's it's out in the high tunnel right now. I'm not too worried about uh, the the temperature levels there. Actually, the high tunnel is full. My high tunnel is full of cool season. Um, crops, flats, and also cool season flowers like sweet alyssum. And I just pretty much have them in the high tunnel with row cover over top of them. Um, I'm not, I don't really keep a, a close eye on the minimum temperature um, because that's something, if it gets cold enough, it's really out of our control. The main thing that I can control is making sure it doesn't get too hot. And so the key thing is, is once I see that um, thermometer creeping up to, I would say, 60 degrees, I'm probably going to go up there and I'm going to roll up a side of the high tunnel. Um, I'll probably take the door down that's on one end of the high tunnel to allow some air to move through there to cool it off. Because, again, I'm not as worried about the cold temperatures at night. I'm more worried about um, the warm temperatures. And once we start getting sunny days again, I... I, I, I will have to start keeping a closer eye on that. Uh, what about air circulation Air circulation in low and uh, high tunnel? And my voice has been cutting out a lot today. I'm sorry. Hopefully that's not the, uh, the case. Uh, hopefully everybody was hearing me okay. Um, 
So when it comes to air circulation, um, kind of hit that with the last question. I, I roll up the sides um, of the high tunnel, and then with the low tunnel, I will just pull um, the plastic over to one side. Um, the one thing I have learned, especially with low tunnel growing, it's kind of like when you start seeds indoors. Um, you you kind of have to harden those plants off when you expose them to those more harsher um, winds and rains and temperatures. Um, I found a couple times when I pulled off the plastic of the low tunnel, the crops did not look very happy after a couple hours of being, you know, hit hit by the wind uh, constantly where where we're at. And so basically, I just have to harden them off a little bit, you know. You take the plastic off a little bit longer and longer every other day. And um, that's pretty much how I handle air circulation. Um, where I'm at, there's so much wind blowing through. We have a very flat site where we're at, very open to the prevailing winds. I don't have to worry about that. Some growers, though, do have to set up fans in, say, their high tunnel. Because um, hot air and cold air uh, layers can get trapped uh, in um, like a high tunnel. This tends to be more of a bigger issue in a greenhouse, but um, it can be a problem in high tunnels too. And so you can have fans blowing from the top of the high tunnel down uh, to the crops to push that warmer air down. You can also put vents on either end of the high tunnel, uh, vents up in the, the top portion of it. Um, just to move, just have a nice uh, a constant flow of air movement through there. But air movement is is very important, um, especially I would say for low tunnels because I, I don't want to have that plastic on there all year long. I, I want to take it off. Those plants are going to get exposed to the elements. And so you have to harden those things off and keep an eye on the plants that you, in, in essence, harden them off uh, to expose them to the elements. Um, another question, how deep should the raised bed be in a low tunnel? Um, well, basically, our raised beds where we're at um, is is dictated by the amount of lumber and money we have on hand to purchase said lumber. Um, so this is a picture right here of the low tunnel. Um, the bed sides here, they are 10 inches. Um, these are 10-inch uh, uh, wide boards. Uh, so there's a portion of it that's a little bit buried, a little bit in the ground. Um, you know, ideally, where we grow here is for mostly demonstration, food donation purposes. Um, and back to the demonstration, you know, it, it would be nice to have these, you know, to add another 10 inches on top of these because um, just, just for reaching down, um, weeding, um, ease of access. Uh, we have people that come to classes here of, of different uh, capabilities. Some folks say uh, it's difficult to bend over, um, or they have uh, you know knee issues, and so you know we want these to be a little bit higher. Um, I don't really know of a um, ideal height for raised beds uh, in in a low tunnel. Um, there might be there might be some type of rule of thumb or might be some wisdom out there. I'm just not aware of it. And um, But they have performed, these 10-inch high beds have performed very well for us this past year. Um, yes, uh, so I mentioned moving the cold frame around. Is that in order to rotate crops? Yes, so I uh, want to be able to rotate crops. So that's really nice about the cold frame is I can move it around and then during the summer months, when I, I don't need a cold frame, I can we just put it in the back, you know, out of the way. Um, and, and so we can use it to rotate crops. And that's another thing I like about low tunnels too, is these are, these are you just pop those hoops out of the ground and you move it to the, the next bed that's gonna be your, your cool season crop bed for that year. So yeah, it's all about crop rotation. Um, what about adding air circulation under uh, covered hoops? Um, I guess if, if if air circulation is a problem, um, you could open up the ends of the low tunnel. So we're in this photograph here, we're looking at an, one end of the low tunnel. I could just open up this end here and then the other end where I'm, where I'm sitting, taking this picture. I would just open this up and let air run 
through the low tunnel. The prevailing wind side's actually uh, this side right here. This is the prevailing wind side right, right there on the right side of the picture. Um, so opening either end up would actually get us uh, probably a nice gentle breeze to move air through there. Um, never really had much of a disease issue when we're growing in the winter months. Again, it's more of a um, it got too cold or it got too hot kind of issue uh, within, within the season extension devices. Uh, let's see, Anita wants to know why she is having issues with germination when direct seeding in August and September outside of a season extension device. Uh, it kind of depends on what crop you're seeding. Um, I, I am a big fan of starting uh, transplants indoors. Um, but if, if you're doing this in August and September, um, you don't have to start these things indoors. Um, actually, I, I work outside most of the time when we're, we're getting fall crops ready. Um, and so the nice thing about transplants uh, for the fall is you can give them some time in, um, in those flats to put on some growth before you got to rip out, say, your peppers or tomatoes to then make room for the salad greens. And so that's why I like um, using transplants for both like early, early spring gardens and for the fall gardening. Um, the germination issues, it again, depends on the type of crop. Um, there are some that germinate really easily, like turnips, got a really good, really good germination there. Uh, carrots, on the other hand, kind of a tough one to grow, kind of tough one to get germination. Kind of the key is, um, you know, keep the soil um, an, an even level of moisture, um, but then back off on the watering once you see germination, start giving it uh, more deeper waterings. And, um, you know, really the, the key thing I've found when it comes to germination is that soil moisture um, and making sure that you prepared that seed bed uh, adequately and, and that the seed is planted at the proper depth. There's some seed that um, needs to be down, you know, maybe an inch or two. And there's other seed that requires light to germinate. So you pretty much just sow it on the surface of the soil. Uh, do you run into trouble with insects um, when raised plastic event? Uh, not in the, not like pretty much, I would say mid fall to mid spring, there are no problems with insects. I will say there is a problem sometimes with rodents. Um, if you're using especially root crops that you're, you're holding over carrots, um, or maybe in my case, we had a bag of potatoes that we we're going to be planting out in the garden later. Um, the mice found that, or the voles found that, um, rodents can be a bit of an issue because, Hey, you've just created a nice place for your plants, nice warm place for your plants all winter. Well, the, the voles and mice think so too. So rodents can be a problem. Um, and there are trapping ways to trap those and then dispose of those rodents uh, appropriately. Can you say the name of the website for tool uh, for the calculating uh, the harvest? Yeah, it was just uh, it was uh, Johnny's uh, Select Seed website. They got a lot of different tools out there for calculating planting and harvesting. Um, you can also get in touch with your local extension office. I'm sure they also have some resources and things um, to share. And let's see, you said the poly cover degrades when it touches what kind of hoop? Uh, so there's a chemical reaction that takes place um, when uh, you use PVC hoops with the plastic poly over top of that. Um, so there, there is, there's a chemical reaction that takes place and a lot of poly manufacturers do not guarantee their product if you use PVC hoops. Uh, Kari said, did some quick research on greenhouse temps for growing herbs. One source uh, shows daytime temps between 70 and 75, uh, nighttime lows of 60 degrees. That sounds great. Thank you, Kari. Uh, let's see, is it needed to fertilize in the winter months? No, I do not fertilize in the winter months. Uh, what I do is I prepare the beds. Um, I call, I pretty much call this, I load them up front with nutrients. Um, so I utilize an organic based um, fertilizer products. I'm not talking certified organic, I'm talking organic based 
So um, I use uh, blood meal and I use uh, composted turkey litter along with uh, about an inch of compost. And I, that is the only fertility that I give to my uh, cool season crops. And I prepare the bed that way, um, rake that into the soil, and then plant my crops into that prepared seed bed or uh, transplant them into that uh, prepared growing bed. Okay, looks like we have hit all of the questions here. Um, got about 250 here. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, the recording of this presentation will be put up on the YouTube channel. Um, and so please uh, check it out. Um, feel free to watch again, leave comments. If you have questions, you can contact me uh, here. This is my contact information. Uh, and again, thank you very much for listening. I uh, hope everybody has a great week.